namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa so in the previous series uh, we talked about the um, formation of Theravada Buddhism through the various schools in India and the establishment of uh, Sri Lanka as the home country of Theravada Buddhism and in particular the Mahavihara Monastery which became the, the seat of orthodoxy in Theravada Buddhism and really the the origin of all the uh, Theravada uh, bhikkhus in, in the world could probably trace their, almost certainly trace their ordination through the Mahabharata. And uh, in this presentation, I want to talk about another very important Theravada country, Burma, and the development of Buddhism in, in Burma over the centuries. To begin with, uh, I'd like to just clarify a, a point of terminology. The official name of Burma is now Myanmar, and um, I'm going to basically just use Burma because it's easier, and it's a, kind of the established uh, traditional name. The name Myanmar was decided upon by one of the recent military governments and the ostensible reason is it's more inclusive of the other ethnic groups in Burma. But this doesn't seem to really make sense because the word Myanmar is actually a literary or poetic name for the Burman people. So it doesn't seem to make sense. It's just changing one, uh, one name for the same group for another. Burma is um, not uh, a unified country ethnically. It's, it's quite diverse. There are different groups there. Historically, there's been four groups that are of some importance. There's many other smaller groups. There's the Burman people themselves who came um, to be the dominant uh, ethnic group within that region, but there's also the, the Mons, who are a people that no longer have an independent country, but they still exist as an ethnic group in parts of Burma and Thailand. But at one time, they, were, they had a very flourishing civilization and were probably the more, um, in the early times, they were probably the more sophisticated and advanced culture in, in Burma through the influence of Indian traders. They were mostly like in the southeast of the country. There's uh, the Shan people in the, uh, in the northeast who are uh, somewhat related to the Thais. They, they're part of the same migration of peoples that were driven south by the Han expansion previously living in, in what's now Southwest China. And finally, there's the Pyu people, P-Y-U. Uh, this is a group that no longer exists as an independent group. They were merged in with the Burmans, but they had one of the earliest civilizations in the upper Irrawada, Irrawaddy Valley. So this is uh, a, just the fairest outline of a background to make sense of the complicated history behind Burma. When we turn to Burmese Buddhism, which is the real theme of this talk, the earliest events are, are the legendary visits of the Buddha to Burma. Now these, um, these can be doubted that they actually historically occurred, but uh, they're an important part of Burmese uh, legendary history that the Buddha uh, went twice to Burma. The first one involved uh, the monk Puna, who incidentally uh, I was originally named after. That was my name when I was a novice, which is Puna. And I think I was named after this character. 
um, he was from uh, uh, the from Burma and um, a, a place called Suparanta, and uh, he went to India, learned, uh, studied with the Buddha, and then asked to return to his home country and spread the Dhamma there. And the Buddha first tried to discourage him and said, "The people of uh, uh, Suparanta are." Are wild and fierce and rough. You don't, uh, you don't want to go back there. And he, he said, no, I'm not afraid. Let me go. And so the Buddha let him go. And then uh, after some time, um, he sent a message to the Buddha, talking about how he was having some success. And the Buddha decided to visit him. And he went in like a magical caravan that Saka, the king of the gods, created five hundred magical palanquins that the uh, the Buddha and uh, 499 Arahant bhikkhus flew through the air to Suparanta. And after he had uh, visited with Puna and preached to the people there, on his return journey, he visited uh, a Naga king, uh, Namada, also in Burma. And during this visit with the Nagas, he left in the stone uh, two footprints that are still, um, still apparently visible and uh, are a place of pilgrimage in, in Burma. The uh, second visit was to the King Chandra Surya, the King of Danawanti in Arakan, that had established a wish to go to India to visit the Buddha. And the Buddha with his psychic power knew that the King wanted to travel to, to India, but he he said, he said that the, uh, the journey would be rough and dangerous and uh, I'll save him the, the trouble. And he went to, uh, again by magical means, he went to Burma to visit this king. And after staying a while, when he was ready to leave, the king begged him to leave a, a relic for them to worship. So he, they wanted an image. So Saka, the king of the gods, again, assisted in this and made a, an image of the Buddha by magical means and the Buddha breathed on it and is said to then have transformed to look exactly like the living Buddha so you couldn't tell the two apart. And it's called the Mahamuni image and that image still exists in Burma although it's been covered by quite a bit of gold foil so that it's a bit obscured uh, and it's just, it's just a place of uh, of reverence and great worship and it's still one of the important pilgrimage sites in Burma. It was originally an Arakan but in 1784 King Bodapaya conquered Arakan and transported the image to Mandalay. Anyway, this is part of the centralization of the Burman state. And this was something we see a, a lot in the history of Southeast Asia that uh, uh, when kings conquer another kingdom, they'll, they'll take the, the most uh, holy relics and, and statues and bring them back to their capital. That's the case of the uh, Emerald Buddha in Thailand. It was similarly moved from Lao. There is one another incident that actually probably has some uh, historical basis. In the uh, Pali Canon, there's the story of the Buddha after he was um, uh, enlightened under the Bodhi tree. Uh, the first people he met were two merchants, Tapusa and Balika. And uh, they became his, um, his first disciples and he gave them the two refuges. It's only two because the Sangha did not yet exist at that time. And they begged him for a relic and he gave them some hairs from his head. And these merchants are said to be from, from Burma. And they traveled back to Burma and enshrined the, the hair in a, in a stupa, which is another pilgrimage place in Burma, is the Shwedagon Pagoda. The first uh, real historical entry of uh, the establishment of Theravada Buddhism in Burma was with Asoka's missions. Um, King Asoka 
sent uh, after the third council he sent missions to many other countries to uh, spread the dhamma and one of these countries that's listed is uh, suwana bumi which means the golden land and that's thought to uh, to be uh, the, somewhere on the, the burmese coast it was probably um to Indian colonies in in the area that, that they first went. There was an establishment of Indian traders and colonists on the on the coast of Burma in those days. So they that, they were already culturally part of the Indian sphere. So that, that they were probably the first recipients of um, of the Ahsoka's missions. But it's said that the missions also converted one of the local kings, and this began the establishment of uh, Buddhism in in Burma. In the um, another famous visit to Burma was in the uh, the fifth century A.D. Buddha Gosa, the great commentator, uh, traveled to Burma. Some Burmese accounts claim that he was originally born in Burma, although this seems unlikely. His uh, biography in the, in the Sinhalese version has him coming from northern India, and he certainly seems in his um, writings to be more part of the Indian cultural sphere than, than Southeast Asian. But in any case, it's said that he visited Burma, and there's one kind of charming story about his visit, that when he first landed, a mole crawled out of the earth and uh, felt reverence towards this uh, holy man and offered some straw and uh, because of this act of merit this uh, mole in a future time became born as one of the great kings of Burma so Buddhism was established in Burma from this this early time from Ahsoka's time which was 220 something BC and it, it spread slowly. The Pew people in the north became uh, very devout Buddhists, uh, at least by the fourth century. In fact, the oldest known surviving uh, Buddhist scriptures, uh, you know, physical scriptures that we have, are, are from the Pew region of Burma, uh, inscribed on gold plates. There's a few uh, sections of, of suttas in, in, um, inscribed on these gold plates that have been found by archaeologists. Uh, but Buddhism was not the only religion in uh, in Burma, uh, and this is this continued for a long time. That there was Hinduism and also Mahayana Buddhism, and uh, the native um, animism, which centered largely around the worship of, of what they called gnats, which were uh, basically nagas, like serpent or dragon beings. And this was a very important part of Burmese belief for a long time, even down to the present. The Burman people came in from the north towards the uh, the end of the first millennium AD. And it seems there the Burmans are related to the Tibetans. They're, they have their language um, has some similarities to Tibetan. And they early on followed a form of Vajrayana Buddhism that was called Ari Buddhism that uh, was existent in Burma for a long time as uh, well into early modern period. It was a form of tantric practice, and it was often denounced by the orthodox Theravadins as being corrupt and um, decadent. The, um, the monks of the Ari tradition uh, not only drank liquor, they performed um, animal sacrifices and... Uh, uh, some of their rights involved uh, sexual acts. So they, they were very 
kind of wild backwoods um, tantric type practitioners and they became for a time very powerful uh, became very rich and they owned at, at one time they owned uh, great tracts of land as uh, and had a great deal of economic power uh, in the 11th century there was a great uh, Burmese king Anarata who established the first um, unification of most of, of what's now Burma by conquering the, the Mon territories. And the Burmans at that time were at a lower level of civilization. They were more uh, kind of barbarian and the Mons had a more sophisticated civilization. So as often happens in history when a barbarian kind of people conquer a more civilized one, they adopt the culture of the of their uh, conquered people. And the, the Mon culture influenced the Burmans after that. So the, um, the Burmans uh, began to adopt Theravada Buddhism. And one very important figure in this process was a monk called Shin Arahan. Shin was is a title. It's a, um, it's like a venerable one or Bante. Uh, Shin Arahan, who uh, became a close confidant of, of uh, he lived a very long time. He died quite old, and he was a confidant of three successive Burman kings, and uh, promoted. Uh, the conversion of the country to Theravada Buddhism. In 1070, the king sent some bhikkhus to Sri Lanka to reestablish the proper ordination there. This was one of several cross-cultural uh, exchanges between Burma and Sri Lanka, which became very uh, important in later times. This was uh, after the period in Sri Lanka when the, the Cholas, the Hindu Cholas of South India had uh, conquered Sri Lanka and uh, ruled it for 70 years and the, the Sangha was um, somewhat persecuted and uh, dispersed and they were in need of re-establishing uh, proper ordination lineage. So the um, monks came from Burma to do that. And this established a, a friendship between the two countries. And in return, the, the king of Sri Lanka sent uh, scriptures back to, to Burma, the, the Tipitaka, so that the, uh, the Burmese now had a complete Tipitaka. And... Uh, part of this um, interchange with Sri Lanka uh, involved the um, repeated several times through uh, Burmese history uh, a reform of the Sangha. The Burmese had sent monks to help the um, the Sri Lankans, and and uh, sometime later the Sri Lankans returned the favor when uh, one of the kings of, of uh, Burma, Uttarawija, decided that the Sangha had, had gotten um, corrupt and they needed to reinvigorate it. So he asked for monks to come from uh, Sri Lanka and start a new ordination lineage and to reform the, the Vinaya. And this caused the first schism because... Uh, some of the monks didn't want to uh, follow the new, the new lineage, and they stayed with the old lineage of Shin Arahan. It was a more native Burmese lineage, so the, the, the two ex coexisted for some time until the, uh, the older lineage died out. The... Um, Civilization of of Burma now in in uh, from eleven hundred roughly to the late twelve hundreds was centered in the the city of P 
Pagan in the north. And uh, this city is known for, uh, even today, for as a tourist destination to see all the multitude of stupas that are have been built there. This became a great uh, activity, a building activity of, of the, the kings to show their 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 faith in the the Buddhist religion, they would they would build stupas, and there's there's thousands of these gold uh, uh, gold plated stupas all, all around Pagan. Some authorities think that this uh, building uh, excessive building of stupas actually ruined the Pagan economy and began the decline of that civilization. That they went to such extremes with this. Uh, Pagan was also noted for uh, the beginnings of serious Buddhist scholarship in in Burma. The uh, the Burmese from this time on put a, a good deal of emphasis on study, and it was a highly literate culture. At um, the estimate is that uh, because of the excellent monastic schools, uh, up to 50% of the, the population, uh, the male population, were literate, and maybe maybe about 10% of the female population, which is a very high number for that world, compared to other countries in the world at that time. And the areas of study that they took took particular interest in was, first of all, Pali grammar. There's a number of Pali grammars and dictionaries and so on that were developed at that time. And then uh, a little bit later, they began to get into Abhidhamma studies, which became a very a very great specialty of Burma, uh, the study and um, promulgation of, of Abhidhamma. Now we move forward in time. You know, after the the fall of Pagan was in twelve seventy one, when the uh, the Mongols invaded, and the 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 whole country was um, the Mongols didn't stay, but they disrupted things enough that that it finished off the Pagan dominance, and for a while the Shan people became the dominant group in uh, in Burma for the next uh, few centuries. One of their kings, Dhamma Zedi, in uh, shortly in the 1470, he reigned from 1472 to 92. Uh, and he, he was a Mon, a Mon ruler. He did an, another one of these periodic reforms of uh, Buddhism by bringing uh, monks over from the Mahavihara and also uh, besides um, purifying the Vinaya, he also made efforts to uh, promote uh, the keeping of the five precepts by lay people, banning animal sacrifice and uh, alcohol. And um, he, he used a, a method of punishing bad bhikkhus. He didn't, because the king actually did not have authority directly to punish a, a bhikkhu who was living outside of the Vinaya, but he could uh, punish their families, which is what what they did. If you, know, if you didn't listen to the king, then your family would suffer for it. There was one Shan king uh, who, in the 1500s, who attempted to destroy Buddhism and uh, persecuted the, uh, the the Sangha and the and the bhikkhus, and this was a short-lived phenomena. Sangha soon recovered, and Theravada Buddhism remained the the dominant religion in the country. In the 1500s, the Burmans again uh, came to the fore and really have remained so ever since. Uh, they, they established what's called the Tongu Empire. And again, there was um, uh, culturally, although politically it was dominated by the Burmans, 
It was culturally uh, influenced by the Mons. And uh, there were again more contacts with Sri Lanka and the, uh, the Mahavihara. And there was a concerted effort to bring the practice in, in terms of the doctrine and the Vinaya and the, the ways of, of behaving in line with the standards established by the Mahavihara, which throughout this, this whole, uh, for many centuries, was regarded as the source of uh, orthodoxy and proper practice. It was like the, the center of Theravada Buddhism in the world was this Mahavihara in Sri Lanka. At this time, the practice of animal sacrifice was finally wiped out. This was something that had been going on all the time, more or less uh, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, even though the country was officially Buddhist, there was a lot of still still pre-Buddhist influences, and the Ari bhikkhus were still around, although they were now uh, fading, and the, the end of the Ari or Vajrayana bhikkhus was dated to this period. This uh, tantric Buddhism died out at this time. But what did survive even down to the present day are what are called Weska, which is a a Burmese word that's a corruption of the Pali Wijadara, which means uh, like magic wielder or wizard. And these are uh, men who practice various kinds of uh, occult spells, do astrology, and, and um, they, they're only very tangential, tangentially related to Buddhism. They do astrology and... Uh, their belief is that if you are a perfect adept in their system, then you'll you'll become an immortal wizard. And they still exist in Burma today, and people go to them for uh, astrological predictions or for curings and so on. And they may be, it's possible that this Weska movement came out of, came out of the, the Vajrayana Ari Buddhists, but it's not certain. Under uh, King uh, Sane in the 16, late 1600s to early 1700s, a controversy started that was to last 100 years that um, seems like a great deal of fuss over something very small, but it really disturbed the Sangha for a long time. There was a, a uh, controversy over whether it was proper to wear the robe <clears throat> with one shoulder bare outside the monastery. And in according to the Vinaya, the bhikkhus are, are supposed to, while they're in the monastery, they wear the, the robe such that one shoulder is, is not covered. Um, and when they go on alms round or they go to, into the village for any reason, they're supposed to fold the robes a different way and cover both shoulders. But these, there's a, a was a, a group of monks who said, no, that's wrong. We're supposed to wear the robes just the one way all the time and leave the shoulder bare. And this became like a huge controversy and caused conflict and even some violence between the two groups of monks. And the the kings at that time still had a lot of influence and say over Sangha affairs. And some kings favored the one-shoulder monks and some favored the two-shoulder monks and it went back and forth. And this, this uh, it reminds me somewhat of, um, uh, if anyone's read uh, Jonathan Swift and, and the Lilliputians and the, the dispute between the big enders and the little enders. <laughs> this is, it's almost the same sort of thing. But this, this went on for like a hundred years. But this wasn't the only thing that was happening at the time. Uh, there was also in the 17th century uh, the beginning of translating Buddhist texts into Burmese language, which uh, allowed um, more lay people to be able to read the scriptures, and generally only the monks would learn Pali. 
So we now have translations, particularly of Abhidhamma again. The Burmese always seem to be fascinated by Abhidhamma. And translations of Abhidhamma and Abhidhamma uh, treatises and commentaries were translated into Burmese language for the first time. Uh, then, uh, in the late 18th century, uh, we have the uh, the great king uh, Bodhipaya, who finally settled the question of the robe wearing issue by uh, calling a great council and making his decision. Okay, from now on, this is how you do it, and it was settled it in the way according, which is the actually the way according to Vinaya that you wear the robe with one shoulder in the monastery and two shoulders without. And as part, uh, and though this was the um, uh, kind of the, the the first business of this council that he called, but uh, it it went beyond that. He he produced uh, or uh, instigated what are called the Sudama or Good Dhamma reforms to reform the Vinaya and keep everything in line. And he established it for the first time an institution of a council of elders, uh, senior bhikkhus, who would be the like the official um, guardians of uh, orthodoxy and the the uh, um, the governors of of the sangha in general, the Sudama council. Then in the um, in the early eighteen uh, hundreds, again a relationship with Sri Lanka, they sent um, bhikkhus to Sri Lanka to reestablish the um, the order there, which had uh, diminished after a, a period of long period of political turmoil in Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka, of course, now is under British rule. And they sent um, monks to Sri Lanka to reestablish uh, an order, the the, Ama, the Amarapura Nikaya. This is something we see in all the Theravada countries that there are several competing ordination lineages. So in Sri Lanka, the um, uh, the older lineage was the the Siam Nikaya that was. Uh, um, established out of uh, Thailand. But they, at, at some point, um, under uh, royal pressure, they imposed a rule that commoners were not allowed to ordain, only members of the noble caste, which is contrary to the Buddhist teaching. So at this point, uh, at this time, they asked to reestablish a new lineage that would be open to everyone, which is what happened. Now, the uh, the the uh, British were now becoming a dominant power in the region, and they um, they conquered Burma in stages. Uh, in the early nineteenth century, they conquered part of Burma in the south and west, bordering on British India. And so this created uh, a new situation because there was a good region, a large region of Burma that was no longer under the control of the king or the Sudama council. And this had both... Uh, positive and inadvertent uh, or negative and inadvertently positive effects on the negative side uh, it did allow a lot of laxity and many of the bhikkhus began to to fall into lax ways and loose vinaya but on the, on the positive side the um, the presence of the Sudama or the dominance of the Sudama council, uh, although it had a good intention, just the, the bureaucratic nature of such a council controlling uh, 
everything in the Sangha did not allow for, um, you know, new developments or, uh, you know, creative expression by, by the bhikkhus in the practice. So when the, when the uh, power of the Sudama Council was lessened in this way, this allowed the beginning of the Vipassana movement, that there were several bhikkhus who uh, at this time began to promote the idea that um, meditation, particularly Vipassana meditation, was more important than chanting or ritual or, or merit-making. And they began to uh, establish these these uh, monastic centers of meditation. One of the first uh, famous uh, teachers in this regard was a man called Madawi, who actually uh, began even before the uh, the the period of British conquest and overlapped with it. He he was the f first famous teacher of Vipassana and his system was based on um, contemplation of the three characteristics across the five aggregates. Now we had the, um, with the British ruling part of India, the uh, remainder of Burma was... Uh, was under the for the last period of Burmese independence was under the reign of King Minden, who is remembered in Burma with great uh, affection. He was considered this is like the Indian summer of uh, independent Burmese civilization. He was considered to be a a, a great king and a very um, uh, strong supporter of, of Theravada Buddhism. One of the uh, actions of his reign was to hold what's called the Fifth Buddhist Council from 1868 to 1871 uh, when he brought uh, bhikkhus from other Buddhist countries and they they uh, went through the whole Tipitaka to try and correct any uh, discrepancies or or uh, errors between the recensions because the Tipitaka by this time existed in Burmese, in Sinhalese and uh, Siamese alphabets and, and separate uh, traditions of um, copying and recension over the centuries. So it was an attempt to reconcile any small discrepancies and, and establish an authoritative text. He also supported the uh, the Vipassana movement. And in this time, the monk uh, Ledi Sayadaw began his career. And he's a very important figure in the Vipassana movement. He's written numerous books. Several of his books are translated into English. And they're very um, technical and very heavily oriented towards Abhidhamma interpretation of mind states that are experienced in Vipassana. So we see this in Burmese Buddhism has this particular characteristic that uh, began really with in Pagan with the emphasis on um, uh, Abhidhamma studies and then in the later period with Vipassana, these two aspects go together very well, Vipassana and Abhidhamma. One is the theory and one is the practice of examining mind states in detail. That brings us uh, pretty close uh, to modern times and of course uh, the Vipassana movement in Burma continued to develop and we have great teachers like Uba Kin, Mahasi Saida and uh, Goenka who all came out of the Burmese tradition and all have some influence of Ledi Saida in their lineage. He was like the great grandfather of all these uh, these traditions. And these uh, Burmese Vipassana traditions have now spread around the world and are uh, have had influence in other Buddhist countries.
Mahasi Saida and Goenka particularly have been practiced in Thailand and in Sri Lanka and also in the West. We have a, a lot of um, meditation centers that have been established in the West that are based on either Mahasi Sayada method or on Goenka's method. And these are all have their roots in, in Burma. And you can trace them back to uh, Lady Sayada. So that's a, a brief uh, capitulation of uh, um, Burmese uh, Buddhism and its uh, trials and tribulations, its connections with an interface with Sri Lanka, and uh, its, its emphasis on Abhidhamma and Vipassana. <laughs>